Hello and welcome into the Cubs on Deck podcast. I am one of your hosts. My name is Greg Huss. And today I'm joined after a pretty decent layoff here, three week layoff. I'm joined by Brian Smith. Brian, how's it going, man? I'm doing good. I made it to uh, Soldier Field for the first time in a couple of years today and saw, you know, the first win in a long time there. So it was a uh, it was a nice little Sunday. So Tyson didn't bring home the win. It was it was Brian that brought home the win. Exactly. I'll take the credit. <laughs> Dude, I feel like I've been well. So like we're we're dropping this episode here on uh, Tuesday, the twenty fourth uh, is when this is this episode is coming out. And like I said, it's been been three weeks. We were scheduled to come out with an episode this past week. Um, I came down with something and wasn't able to record, so I figured, honestly, pushing it off to our regularly scheduled Tuesday mornings is good. Um, so right today, it's just just me and Brian. Um, as we I mentioned last time we recorded, we'll be coming to you guys with some interviews throughout the offseason. I've got I've already got a few different ones in the works uh, lined up, so uh, that'll be coming. Right now, you just get the two of us, and given that we've been three weeks off, uh, we do have some things that we kind of want to hit on. We're kind of a, a smorgasbord of topics today. Nothing really set in stone, um, but multiple different things going on here. Um, the AFL, AFL, sorry, Arizona Fall League, I can't say it. Uh, the Arizona Fall League has been going on the past few weeks, we're, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, we also have, as soon as the World Series ends, uh, minor league free agency is official, so we're going to lose some players potentially there. We'll talk about that. Uh, and then you guys, listeners, sent in some questions. We'll hit on some of those listener questions that are pretty good uh, towards the end of this episode. So um, it is absolutely fall. Uh, I've been doing the fall things. The past couple of weeks, we went, went to the pumpkin patch. We carved some pumpkins. We've uh, been watching a lot of football. It's very, very fall. So let's talk about the Arizona Fall League. Uh, James Triantos is the man. I mean, he's he's taking the world by storm down there. Yeah, and it's like I mean it it's amazing. He held a 500 batting average basically for like half the league season. Just incredible stuff. I mean, there have been there are always guys that go down there and are super hot and you know run a ridiculous like video game batting line, but I don't remember seeing a guy who's hit 500 for almost, you know, 40, 50 at bats like he like he did. He came off a little bit the last couple of days, but you know, they're still just absolutely absurd numbers. Yeah, I mean, he he to run through them real quick. I'm looking at this is on reference. I think that Baseball Reference has him updated. Um, but through 13 games, uh, we're recording this on Sunday night. Through 13 games, 61 plate appearances. That's a 4.31 batting average, a 5.25 OBP, a 7.65 slug. So it's all right. A, a, a 12.89 OPS, which I think is pretty decent. Last time I checked. Yeah, a couple years ago when um, Nelson Velasquez was in the Arizona Fall League, I wrote an article and basically I found that if you had over a 900 OPS, I think it was uh, thereabouts, your odds of succeeding in the major leagues historically were about the same as a top 50 prospect in baseball. Um, And, you know, like Nelson Velasquez fell off that radar quite a bit, I think, as far as his prospect shine before he was traded goes to Kansas city and he certainly looks sort of the part that of, of that guy that like we were hyping when he was in the Arizona fall league. And so it's, it's exciting to see yet another guy sort of passing that mark in the Cubs system, especially a guy that that really didn't have any experience above a ball besides that tiny little cup of coffee and double a. Yeah, man. I mean, like I'm just looking in, in those 51 at bats, two homers, three doubles and four triples, which is, yeah. which is not like the four triples, obviously not sustainable. Um, but it's, and, and this is an offensive driven league, right? So, but, but not even to more this so extent. this year, I think. Yeah. But not to this extent, you know? Yeah. So uh, I guess what, how do you view this kind of incredible for performance from Triantos? Like, what does this, what does this mean for, for him and for the Cubs moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I think what's what's interesting about the Cubs system is you have, you know, you have Matt Shaw and James Triantos, who who really fills sort of a similar bucket, you know, yeah. right handed infielders who like you're still trying to figure out, are they second baseman? Are they third baseman? Do they maybe have to move to the outfield? Like very, very similar players. And I think what James is showing this year, like, you know, Matt went to college and was a stud in in D1. James went the other route he he went to the Cubs system right out of high school and and now he's sort of having that same breakout that you know I'm sure would have led to him being a first round pick next year had he gone to college and so I think what he's basically showing is like hey I'm on the same level 
And now whether the Cubs decide to let it play out a little while longer and try to find their third baseman of the future from those two, or whether they deal one of those guys knowing that they have the other one, I think it opens up a bunch of options, which is, which is really good. Just, you know, organizationally. Yeah. You mentioned like he's at the same level and like, I know you meant from like, in terms of like their prospect status to a certain degree, but also like literally they're going to both be in starting yeah. off the year next year in double a. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's super interesting. And, and you're right. Like they're very similar. We talked about on our award show last, last episode um, we talked about like the best field to hit. And I think that Zumac picked uh, Triantos and I picked Matt Shaw and it's yeah. like, they, they're so similar in a lot of different ways. I think that, in looking at these guys, I'd probably give like the athleticism edge to Matt Shaw. Obviously, I think that's like that's where he stands out the most, and that makes me believe in his defense wherever he ends up, whether it's second or third. Like I, I, I'm way more confident in in Matt Shaw ending up at second or th- third than James Triantos ending up at second or third. You know what sure. I mean? Yeah. Um, and so I don't. I, I know I didn't list this in the listener questions, but we did get a, a question. Um, from somebody asking about like does does what James Triantos is doing in the Arizona uh, Fall League, does that impact him maybe being dangled out there as a trade candidate this off season? And I think that, in my opinion, he was already like a good that that was he was a good candidate to be traded for for some some major league talent this off season. I think that maybe this helps. I think maybe he gets in front of some more scouts um, from other teams potentially this in the Arizona Fall League, but. Um, he was always kind of on that list of guys that that could potentially be traded this offseason. Yeah. I mean, honestly, because of that research I did, I do put some stock in the Arizona Fall League, and this does sort of matter to me. I think that yeah. I will probably end up bumping James up a couple spots, you know, whether, you know, he's not going to an entirely different tier in my rankings. You know, for me, you know, he's not sort of in that top four area. But for a guy who was sort of – maybe just outside the top 10 or maybe at 10. Like, I think he's pretty firmly in there now because he's really proven that like this bar of pitching that they have in the Arizona fall league is not too much for him at all. And, you know, what I've noticed from just watching clips and stuff is it seems like high fastballs, especially like this league is, is he's getting a lot of those and it is like, man, I mean, that is pitching a guy to his absolute strength. Like James, I think is so good at getting his hands up there, sort of even like meeting that ball on its plane or even getting on top of it a little bit, like just not the kind of guy that, that um, you can really beat in that area. And it seems like pitchers have not adjusted. They keep going up there. And so it's, it's really nice because that's a, that's obviously a, a big part of major league baseball these days. And I think that that's one thing that like, even at the top level, he's going to be able to handle. Yeah, I I think the easy route is to go and like compare Matt Shaw and James Triantos, but I, I think that the conversation, especially given on where they're probably going to rank an offseason prospect list um, as far as Cubs' top 30s, 40s, whatever you want to call them, the conversation between James Triantos and Moises Ballesteros is kind of interesting. Because yeah. um, I think you look at both those guys and it's like, yeah, they can obviously hit. Uh, but position, you know, it's like, it's, it's, and with Moises, it's like, can he stick at catcher? Um, and then if probably not, then it's like, all right, then first base or DH James Triantos is like, can he stick at second and third? Um, if not, is he an outfielder? Like it's, it's the defensive questions behind young guys for their level that have exceptional hit tools and flashes of pop. Um, and so I think that conversation between those two guys is interesting too. And when Triantos got assigned to the Arizona Fall League, I thought that the outfield experiment that they did very briefly in South Bend was going to be part of it. I thought they were going to use that, you know, use this sort of developmental league to start to break him in more with that role that they definitely like, they definitely flirted with moving him at least for a while and seeing what it looked like. But the fact that they aren't is really interesting to me. And, you know, I think... You know, it'd be really weird now for him to go to outfield out of spring training next year. I think what they're telling us by the fact that he's playing infield in the Arizona Fall League is that he's going to play infield for Tennessee next year. Yeah, five games at at second base, one game at third base, three games in center, and then one game in left field in the Arizona Fall League. Oh, that's more than I thought, to be honest. Well, it's more, but also, like, I, I think that when people see that, a lot of times they're like, oh, like, great, like, they're... They're, they're working them in multiple different positions, like getting that flexibility. It's like, I, I don't, 
I don't know. I guess I don't really buy into that where it's like, let's go to the Arizona fall league or let's even like go to the minors and work on multiple different positions. Like we got to get you. I'm not, I'm not saying that James Ferrantos has to like perfect second base. That's not what I'm saying. But I think that he, if he's playing multiple different positions, he has to be like decent at multiple different positions. You know, like sure. that again, if we're throwing different examples, like Christopher Morrell this season, right. He was being, worked before like before the season last year as like okay he can be that utility guy playing multiple positions but we found out this year that hey if you can't play multiple positions well or even one position well then you're it's so hard to get in the lineup for, for designated hitter at a lineup yeah so um i don't like i don't see what the positions he's played in the arizona fall league and say oh like this is this is good that he's playing multiple positions i'd rather him just like play all the games in left and center or yep. play all the games in second and second and third. I don't know. Uh, that's just I a weird agree. situation, I guess. Yeah, the other interesting thing with him and Ballesteros is just, you know, those are two guys that are big-time hit over power that I think the Cubs yeah. would love for the power to jump sort of one more level. Um, I know Triantos, when he was drafted, for me, you know, he swings he swings really hard. His bat speed is, is easily there. My hope was, like, could he evolve into an Ian Kinsler-type player? Um, but he's, you know, I think that swing has still just stayed so flat and so yeah. like on plane and, um, there's no uppercut at all to it. And so it's, it'll be really interesting to see, like, you know, now that he's showing just this level of hit tool at this high of a level, like do the Cubs just at this point, not mess with it. They're like, okay, this is an elite tool and we don't want to risk it. Or are they like, you know, we think your hand-eye coordination is good enough that if we add a little bit of tilt to your swing, you know, we think you'll be able to make up for it. That, that those are really interesting questions that I think they they have to play with. And um, you know, the fact that he's succeeding while they're asking these questions is is way better than if it was the other way around. Yeah, I think any power that he added, and I think he did add more power this year, but it was all yeah. based on like he just bulked up more. Like he's just, yeah. he's a stronger guy. Uh, not any alter. He didn't alter his swing. I don't know. And I mean, to bring it back, I think that that's something that might be more valuable to another team than it is to the Cubs. Where like they see James Triantos and they say, you know what? Like we we are absolutely all in on getting a little tilt on that, that swing. You know, yeah. it's like it may be something they're more willing to um, take that gamble than the Cubs are after seeing what Triantos has been. And I'm not I. You'll, I don't think you'll see either of us or, or Zumac or any of the, the prospect uh, folks out there like shouting for the Cubs to trade any of these prospects because it's like, I want, I want all these guys to succeed in Chicago, but I also want them to succeed else, elsewhere. But um, I, I think that he's just a good candidate in general, especially when we're seeing, when we're seeing what we're seeing um, in the fall league. So um, let uh, a couple more guys. Uh, we probably won't touch on on the pitchers much here. Uh, not much to 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 write home about as far as the Cubs pitchers in the Arizona Fall League. But uh, Kevin Al Alcantara has been as fun as he always is, dude. Like yeah. Kevin Alcantara has been he's been ultra streaky uh, in a, in a short time period, I guess. As short uh, of a time period as you can be streaky, but. Uh, he's put on a show a couple different times with the moonshots that he's had down in the the Arizona Fall League. Yeah, and also some really good plays in the field that I think, yeah. you know, I think there have been two or three plays that are like legit highlight reel worthy, um, which is really exciting. Uh, one I know in right, like I think that I think that that guy is like a future gold glove right fielder. Um, so that's always exciting to me when when I see him make good plays out there because I just feel like that's the long term home. And yeah, the plate like that is who he is right now is like, you know, when he connects, he's connecting with impact um you know there's there's still like a little bit of like i don't know barrel inaccuracy or so like he's he's not as sort of like dialed in to getting that bat to the ball as some other guys but um when he does it's really exciting and you know i think i think he's proven that he belongs at this level that he'll be fine at double a next year but i think he's also probably shown himself some things that he needs to work on and that he'll be able to go into this rest of this off season working on maybe even going to the Dominican winter league and, and getting some reps there too, which is, which would be nice to sort of double dip in winter ball. Yeah. Yeah. 12 games. Uh, he's got three home runs. He's got 12 RBIs. 
but he also has 17 strikeouts. Uh, batting 188, but he has a 417 slug, so 727 OPS. I mean, it, it's 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 a small sample size, uh, but it's fun to see. Like you're right, I think that it's enough to say like he's holding his own um, in that league, and that he'll be fine to start off the year next year in Double A. But also like. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to be shouting for a, a major league call up for Kevin Alcantara by mid season next year. You know what I mean? So right. I think that, that he is, he's kind of, while Triantos is going above him, above and beyond what I expected to see from him in Arizona, Kevin Alcantara, it's like, all right, I, I just feel good about it. You know, like he's, he's, he's just doing what he should be doing at his age, um, from his level down in Arizona. A guy like that, like he knows how he's going to get pitched forever, right? Like he's so big and long that they're always going to try to jam him high and inside and use his R, his length against him. And then they're going to alternate that high and inside with sliders low and away. And it's just like, honestly, like the most it bats he can get, the better for him because like it's going to look the same always. It's going to get better and better, but it, the scouting report is never going to change. So what we need from him is just, more and more reps. I and he has shown right now the ability to get to those inside pitches. Yeah, he gets um, his hands in really well. Really well. It's going to be important that he continues to do that when the fastballs have a little bit more hair on them. Yeah. Um, but more importantly, when the when the sliders are running away uh, with more zip. You know what I mean? Like it, it's it's it, the the pitches just have a little bit more life on them as he continues to rise, climb up the ladder. So. Uh, him turning on an inside pitch is a whole lot easier down in, in South Bend than it is going to be in AAA or AA, you know? So, uh, yeah, that's going to be important. But he can do it right now. Yeah, I worry the most, honestly, about those breaking balls that get away, that that are running away from him a little bit because he can – he's way less um, – he, his, like, step forward is way less than it used to be and way less pronounced, but he can definitely get caught, like, yeah. in front a little bit and committing a little too early. And so – double a is going to be huge next year for that because i mean you're going to see just the best group of sliders like every guy who comes in the seventh eighth inning is going to have a good slider and you know it's uh it's going to be a really important test for him and i think this is just sort of giving him like an early look at what that's going to be like last hitter is christian franklin who was on the roster down in arizona um he got in a few games which is fun to see he was a fun fun selection to go down there he was the um wasn't he the replacement for yes. alexander canario Yep. Um, which is fun to see him get down there. Uh, you were saying he is no longer on that, on that roster. He is he's not, not he's not while. listed on the roster. I think, I think we've sort of heard externally that he's, that he doesn't seem to be with the team anymore. So yeah, I think it was a, it was a very brief look that is now um, probably in the past. Yeah. And I, I think that, that getting a few extra reps is, is never a bad thing, especially for, for him who needs as many reps as possible, having missed some in the first couple of years of his pro career. Uh, I'm excited, dude. I'm excited for Christian Franklin next year. He, he's one of the guys I'm I'm probably on my on my top 10 of most excited for entering the 2024 season. Yeah, it was an insane second half. Like he, he was just so good. Um, so clearly, like, um, I mean, kind of became the best hitter on that South Bend team for a pretty prolonged stretch there. And so um, just one of those guys that it's like, if you show me you can do it in double A, then you are like firmly on the radar. He sort of reestablished his value. Yeah. From when he was drafted for me this year, but like you start to do it in double A next year, like that's a guy who could be on mid season top 10 lists in the cub system next year. That, that would not surprise me. Yeah. That's actually a really good way to describe it is he, he's, I, I think we, there was quite a bit of hype for him right after he was drafted. And then yeah. it was like, I, it wasn't like a, Oh, like not what we had hoped. It was just, he was injured. Um, yeah. So I think that now at this point we're like, Oh, like now, now I know why we were excited to begin with. And this, yeah. he's, he's kind of showing that now. So that's exciting. Um, is there anything you want to hit on with the, with the pitchers before we move on to minor league free agents? Cause I don't have a whole lot to be completely honest with you. Yeah. I mean, I would just say in general, like this is probably a league where they're, where they're trying to get these guys to the innings total that they had in mind for them. Um, that's probably more important than, um, success generally speaking, you know, I mean, they're, they're going to be working with these guys on certain pitches and stuff, but like a guy like Nick Hull, for example, he pitched a lot his last year in college. I don't even think he got to the same innings total this year that he did that last year in college. So I think they just want to get a few more innings for him. Um, a guy like Adam Lasky, like, you know, what's interesting. I was just thinking about Adam Lasky the other day and I was like, it might be, it might be worth 
even stretching him out again next year and seeing what it looks like, like start him as a piggyback starter. If it starts to work well, even give him a try as a starting pitcher again. Cause I thought he had a really impressive year and, um, and he has a diverse enough pitch mix that I think it might be able to work. And if the control is starting to look a little better, like that's one thought I had, that's sort of the role that Tyler Santana, who's also there already has. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I mind that. That that wouldn't be too bad. It, it's interesting. I, I think another thing that that doesn't really get mentioned, um, especially with, with pertaining to the pitchers, is that I mean they're around different people than they're with all season long, right? Yeah. So you just get to you get to interact with with different teammates from other organizations, other coaches from other organizations, um, and and doing that, you just get different ideas about pitch grips, about the way to attack hitters. It's just. I mean, I, I think that there are plenty of guys for um, Tyler Santana or Nick Hole to be around in the Cubs organization to get different thoughts from. But it just it, it when you're when the Cubs development staff is preaching certain things over the course of the year that I think that there's just a chance in the Arizona Fall League to just get different ideas from other organizations or other 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 teammates, you know, so that's yep. that's a fun thing. And I think that that, that there's I, that's a tough way to kind of. You don't hear examples of that unless a guy is super successful in a few years based off a pitch they learned from a different guy in the AFL. You know, it's like you don't hear those stories as much, but like I think that that for sure happens down there. Yeah, I agree. That's a good point. Um, All right, let's talk MILB free agency because we will talk some Rule 5 draft stuff this offseason. That's a given. Although the rule, I, I I will forewarn you guys, the Rule Five draft is far less fun this year than it's been in the past few years. <laughs> the past few years has been a little more wild, but um, we'll get into that later this off season. Before that, we got to talk about uh, minor league free agency because as soon as the World Series ends, is when those guys, just like the major league free agents, they can hit the open market. The exception is um, if a guy gets added to the forty man roster and and therefore protected and kept in the organization or if a guy is signed back to a minor league deal, which has happened in the past in the Cubs organization. So um, I think we'll spend almost all the time on this topic talking about two guys, Luis Vasquez and Jonathan Perlaza, because they are both minor league free agents and they are head and shoulders the most prominent names of this Cubs minor league free agent class. So uh, you want to talk, which one do you want to talk about first here or them together? Yeah, I mean, we could talk about Vasquez first. I think, you know, one one important thing to note about this process in general is like these who we're going to talk about are guys that are eligible for free agency. What usually happens in this process, I know this because of Jonathan Perlaza last year, is guys who are eligible for free agency for the first time. Generally, what the Cubs are going to do and any organization does with their guys is they offer them something called a successor contract. Basically, it's just a one year minor league deal saying like, hey, like we didn't get quite as far in this process as we wanted to. We still believe in you. Like, give us one more year. Um, Generally, like I would say if a guy doesn't have a clear path to a major league contract elsewhere, it sort of behooves him to sign that deal. And we often see that. That's why, like when we eventually see the list of Cubs minor league free agents, it will be less than, than it looks like it can be today. Cause some guys will have uh, already signed that, uh, you know, those agreements probably were made in September or so. Um, but when, when we look at a guy like Luis Vasquez, who normally would fit in that bucket. And I think the Cubs probably went into this year thinking he was in that bucket. He got too good. And I think there's a chance that, you know, there could be another team out there that, that gives him a major league deal. There could be another team that says, Hey, like we don't have a great major league shortstop. We'll pay you a minor league deal. That's very expensive. You have the everyday triple A job locked up and a clear path. If you, if you keep doing it, like we don't have a shortstop at the major league level and you can have that role. Um, And you know, the Cubs are going to stare at that and say, man, like, do we want to risk losing that? Because we can see that deal out there. And if they think that there's a chance that Luis has that offer on the table, then they might have no choice but to throw him on the 40 man roster and sort of uh, protect him or like keep him from reaching that sort of arrangement with another team. Yeah. I, Jonathan Perlaza, like you mentioned, is a good, good example of that last year, right? Where he, 
Um, he was brought back on the successor. It was actually kind of funny last year because it was it was not official anywhere the the Jonathan Perlaza, but it was the worst kept secret because like I I included him on my on my top prospect list last year, like at, at like the the forty range or whatever it was, right? Um, I included him there because we all kind of knew everyone kind of knew that he was back with the Cubs. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think with with Perlaza, he got that chance to all year long man left field or right field or whatever. He, he, he was in the lineup every day for the most part um, for the Iowa Cubs. Um, never got that call up to Chicago, which I think that he was, he was doing everything he could to get that call to Chicago literally the entire year long. Uh, I think the fans were very ready for him to get the called out. Um, but yeah, you're right with Luis. It's just, he, he was too good. I mean, defensively, he, we gave him the award for the best defensive infielder in the organization last week or last episode. And, yep. um, I, he is, he is maybe the best defensive shortstop that I've seen or defensive infielder I've seen since I've started covering, covering the Cubs, uh, prospects. Like he is, he's damn good out there. Um, yeah. and so you have that. And then the fact it, it's, it's really the fact that he did offensively and it's kind of speaking for itself, but did offensively what he did this year. And that's what makes him, that pick for another team to pick him up. So he, yeah, I'm with you. I think that it's kind of a no brainer that he gets out of the 40 man roster here. Um, and then Jonathan Perlaza is, I, I'm kind of leaning the other way where I, I kind of don't expect him to be added to the 40 man roster and protected or kept in the organization that way. Um, just because I, I think not because I wouldn't necessarily, it's more because I saw the way the Cubs handled not calling him up the entire year long. And, and my thinking is that if they had any intention to keep him on the 40 man or add him to the 40 man roster this off season or keep him on the 40 man roster, that would already happened uh, throughout the season this year. You know what I mean? Like, I think that, that, that chance has kind of come and gone. Um, so I don't see them doing it with Perlaza, but yes, I see them doing it with, with Vasquez. Yeah. I made a little rough prospect ranking the other day and, you know, I had Luis Vasquez as the number 15 prospect in the system, you know, huge jump up this year. And Perlaza, I actually think I didn't end up ranking him, but I think he would be sort of in the 30s somewhere. And that difference is, um, you know, if you look at their offensive output, Perlaza has the advantage. The difference, of course, is like the position value. Um, if Vasquez could even be a league average hitter, he's going to be a huge net positive player because of what he does and because of the value of, you know, just a guy who can hack it at shortstop. Uh, Perlaza on the other hand is a bad outfielder. Um, and, and just, you know, a switch hitting probably like left field only outfielder on a team that has Ian Happ signed to an extension. Like, you know, there's, there's a problem there. And like, we often say that prospects don't really get blocked that like that get that's a very overrated narrative. Like every once in a while with a guy who's sort of on the fringe, up against an established major leaguer, it does happen. I think it's sort of happened here. And I think like the Cubs and Perlaza and his representatives, like I think everyone's going to probably walk away from this, like very happy with the experience. Yathan's career was sort of headed down a much different path a couple years ago. He came back from that COVID break. Um, I think a really renewed player and the Cubs sort of helped him get to that next level. And uh, I think I think he'll find a really good opportunity somewhere, but yeah, I, I expect it to not be with the Cubs. I think forever one of my like one of my favorite prospects to watch play. I mean, yeah. like every time he leans back when he when he really gets one, that just it, it, he, he's a fun guy to watch watch hit. That's for that's for damn sure. So yeah, I'm with you. I had I have both those guys ranked right around where you do um, in terms of where and it takes a top twenty top thirty prospect reaching minor league free agency to add him to the 40 man roster. You know, like you're, you're yeah. not, you're not adding a guy who's ranked outside the top 30 um, right. typically. Um, so yeah, it takes, it takes a Luis Vasquez 2023 type performance to get that addition. Um, there's several guys. There's a lot of other guys hitting minor league free agency. Is there anybody else that stands out as a guy that you either would like to see the Cubs bring back on a, on a, a minor league on a successor deal minor league free agent deal or someone that you kind of expect the Cubs to do that? Like either your perspective or the Cubs perspective. Sure. I mean, the guy that I just really hope comes back is a Nunez, who I think had a, had a really good year, really big step forward. Like 
always a guy that's that's had the arm talent. Um, I think in 2022 made some improvements with that breaking ball that that continued this year. Uh, but in 2022, like didn't throw anywhere close to enough strikes for it to work. He didn't really either in 2023, like he's still walking way too many guys, but it was, it was like a big jump forward and he was effective even with the walks. Um, Cause he was just, you know, he just blows it by guys. Um, and so I would really like that to have, I'd really like one more year with the Cubs looking at that and seeing, you know, if he can handle double a for a long stretch if it's going well in June, July, like push him to triple a sort of see what's what, and then you can make a decision. So I hope he comes back, but that's going to have to be a minor league deal only. Um, he's probably the one that jumps out the most to me. Yeah. I, it, Steven Gonzalez is a guy that I, I think I've, I've just heard nothing but good things um, in terms of, of him as a teammate coming up to the system. I know that, that BK, mm-hmm. I think on the show was talking about, um, was talking about Gonzalez down in, in South Bend and how he's kind of just they're kind of mentoring the younger players down in South Bend during his his short time there, made it back up to Iowa. He's kind of been in the org he's been in the organization a few years now, right? Like it's yeah. he's been he's been a weird situation situation where he's been injured a lot. Um I, I'm not speaking necessarily from I think the stuff is great or he could be a major league contributor down the road. It's just I I it's nice having good dudes in the organization and from everything I've been told Steven Gonzalez is is that good dude so um he's on the list for sure for me um I Giovanni Cruz is reaching minor league free agency and that's sad to me personally because he was always a guy that like in the the back whether it was like the also worth mentioning in the back back of my prospect rankings or like early on it was like let me just find a way to squeeze him in at like number 40 or whatever um, I was always really excited about Giovanni Cruz. I just thought the stuff was really, really good. He just couldn't stay healthy and couldn't command his stuff when he was. But uh, so it's going to be sad seeing him reach minor league free agency for sure. Him getting to like even eligible for minor league free agency just makes me feel like I'm like a decade older. It's yeah, like, how, are, how are we already on the other side of that? Uh, yeah, that's kind of wild. Yeah, I, well, I talked, I mean, Ben Hecht is, is at minor league free agency now. Yeah. And I talked about on, I, I, probably not on this show, but on the, on, on growing Cubs with Jimmy, we talked about how, how we, we, me and Jimmy played against Ben Hecht in high school. Oh, cool. And so that makes me feel real old is, yeah. is seeing him reach minor league free agency. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't as know. As far as Giovanni Cruz goes, he is like the perfect example for what we talked about with that minor league successor deal. Yeah. I would almost guarantee the Cubs offered that. I don't really see a reason why Cruz wouldn't accept that. So I, I, I will be very surprised when the final list comes out of Cubs minor league free agents if he's on it. Cause it just makes sort of too much sense for both people to have him, have him come back, um, you know, hopefully get healthy for a full run and, and everyone can sort of get a look at what they've been working on the last few years. Last thing the people want to know, is this the end of the Braylon Marquez era in Chicago? Yeah, probably. Um, I think he probably showed enough to get a deal with another team, which yeah. I think is important. Uh, for his future and I you know I think the Cubs will sort of give their blessing on him to look for those opportunities and so if it's there for him um, I think it makes a lot of sense you know it was they really like they really pushed it the last few years to try to make it work to keep trying to get him back on the field and healthy again and you know he had some moments this year where he looked good and you know I'm happy for him that he that he got back out there because there's no guarantee you missed two seasons with a shoulder injury like it that that oftentimes that's it yeah speaking of what the people want to know uh we got some listener questions that were sent in nice. um to us on twitter uh we got three that we're going to cover here today uh the first is timely considering the mlb playoffs going on right now uh steven monk sent in a question uh, asking about moises ballesteros who we've already talked about a little bit today um he said moises ballesteros and kyle schwarber compare and contrast which is fun. I mean, this is kind of a fun, a fun one. Given, I I don't know that I've ever thought about those two in the same like in the same thought, but it's kind of fun to look at those two guys, especially with what Kyle's doing and just mashing every chance it gets whenever he comes to the plate for the Phillies. Yeah, it makes sense. It's just sort of the catching history, and you know, uh, I guess I guess how we think of Biasteros's future, um, maybe being like 
partial catcher, but also sort of partial DH like how Schwarber was when he sort of first got to the majors. Um, yeah, that, it, that's really fun one. Schwarber, you know, what stuck out to me this, this off season is just like, or I mean, this October in the playoffs is like Schwarber just looks like, I mean, he's gotten himself in such good shape over the years. I mean, you look at a picture of that guy in the 2016 playoffs when he came back from his injury, like, you know, that hit the, and when he runs to first base and he's given the fist bump to the bench, like, you look at that versus the guy who's like celebrating in the Phillies dugout. They do not look like the same person. He has done incredible work to stay, to stay fit over the years. And that's really cool. Yeah, that's a good point. I saw the quote that I think Bryce Harper was saying that, that Kyle Schwarber is country strong. And I think that he, he was country and, and still is country strong. Kyle Schwarber is, but now he's also just like, like weightlifting strong as well. He's like a man, he, he's, yeah. yeah, he's he's a grown ass man. So yeah, I, I think in comparing c- contrasting the the two, the, the the ways they're similar is kind of what you described with the the catching question marks. The the what position is he? Remember the Kyle Schwarber at first base experiment in in Boston? Yeah. That was interesting. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think the, the the biggest difference is that when Kyle was even when Kyle was a prospect, I think it was. It was the power tool was absolutely there. And it's like, let's make sure that the contact tool, like the, the hit tool is rises to the level it needs to be. And with, with Biasteros, it's the other way where like that, that, that hit tool is very clearly there. The power tool has to rise up to the occasion as well. Um, but I, I will say when Schwarber was coming up, I thought he was going to hit for a much better average than he did. I, yeah, I, agree I, I am. I was surprised sort of his whole tenure with the Cubs that the hit tool just didn't play at all in the majors. And I think sort of looking at him now and sort of thinking about what's happened over the years. And I think this speaks to the difference between these two guys. Like Schwarber is excellent at backspinning a baseball. Like if you, when you watch those home runs, what he does is like, he sort of got that like chop uppercut swing and he meets a baseball and he, and he hits it obviously very hard, but what he, when he hits it very hard, that ball is spinning backwards. He's, I think he's probably one of the best in baseball at like his best contact also makes a ball spin backwards, which is going to make it go farther. So it makes his power tool play up more. I think by he's got a little bit of uppercut to his swing, but to me, like you see a lot of like top spun doubles to gaps yes. and things like that. Like yes. he is not a guy that's sort of meeting the ball, you know, to backspin a ball. You're sort of like meeting the bottom of it sort of on your downswing a little bit. Um, He's sort of meeting the ball almost more. It seems like on his upswing Um, that might be an oversimplification, but that to me is the difference. Um, You know, they both, um, they both have really pretty swings, uh, but, but very different ones at that. The, one of the best, I don't know. It was, it was, I don't know who said it was like a coach way back when to me, but like you talk about slicing the baseball and, what you want to have happen is you want your bat slicing the baseball, not the baseball slicing off your bats. Like that's, that's, that was yeah. like one of the most simple descriptions that I heard of that kind of concept. Um, yeah. But it makes all the sense in the world, right? Like that, the, the way in which you want your bat to meet the ball. And you're right. That, that's what's allowed Schwarber's power to play up. And that's what Biasteros needs, needs to get to. I think there's, there's multiple things that Biasteros needs to get to in order to kind of have that power play. And we talked about it a lot on the show in terms of, turning on balls a little bit better. And he, he did that more as the year went on, which was fun, but like, he's just not making the right kind of contact to send the ball out um, um, 450 feet. Like what college Schwarber does on, on what seems like a daily occurrence, you know, I w- I always was so frustrated that Schwarber didn't do what like Cody Bellinger did this year, getting that sort of second serve swing with two strikes where you're, you know, yeah. you become much shorter um, you think a lot more about that oppo gap, you know, Biasteros is very much focused on that oppo gap and it succeeds yeah. in that direction a ton. He almost doesn't need it like to change his swing with two strikes because he's just sort of naturally better meeting the ball. Um, but that was, that was always the thing that bug bugged me the most about Kyle was like, he was, he's sort of very stubborn in in his swing being his swing and staying in that because I think he's like more talented uh, a more talented hitter than sometimes the results show, but also like, you know, we're now talking about the guy with the third most home runs in playoff history. So like, you know, keep doing your thing, dude. Like, <laughs> I, I also just love watching that guy play and always will. So, you know, I, 
I'm glad that I'm glad we get the home runs we do out of him, even if it means a bunch of strikeouts. I'm trying to think back and maybe I, I, I think I know my answer, but I, I it might be hindsight a little bit. Can you remember how you thought about Kyle Schwarber as a catcher as he was coming up to the system? And how would you compare how you felt about Kyle the catcher compared to Moises Ballesteros now as a catcher? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think Ballesteros, um, you know, I think the questions about him staying a catcher are way more just like the body is bad. And like, you know, that just, that, that, that won't translate athletically well. Um, with Schwarber, I think it was way more like the hands were really bad, you know, like he, he stabbed at balls when he caught them and things like that. Like Moises is way more natural at receiving yeah. than, than Kyle ever was. Yeah. I, I, that's what I was going to say actually, is that I, I just, I think that because of his body right now, I think that Moises gets a, a little bit of a bad rep when it comes to, to his catching. Now he still has a ways to come. Like I, it's not, <laughs> it's not even it's not going to be an average catcher at this point. You know what I mean? But yeah, I think I'm a little more confident in Moises staying back there than I was ever was at Kyle staying back there. And I don't, honestly, I don't even know that it's a bad rep. Like, I don't know that that's even fair to say because like it sort of is what it is, right? He has a bad body. Like he sort of just sort of like that, that I think he works really hard and that's, and the Cubs, like you hear that behind the scenes a ton but he just has one of those bodies that's sort of built to, to carry weight and he's always going to fight it and fighting it is always going to be like what he needs to do just to sort of get passable because, you know, you really have to move behind the plate a lot more than I think the casual viewer sees, like not only just throwing hitters out or fielding bunts, like just that ability to sort of move around back there is important. And that's the thing that I think um, people question about whether he can last. That's fair. Yep. Uh, we have another question from Northside Soundtrack asking, what is your, what is our outlook on Christian Hernandez moving forward? Which I think that uh, he has been the, the topic of more listener questions Christian has uh, over yeah. the last three years than any other player. Um, and that's fair. But uh, I guess, Brian, where do you see him being assigned Christian first? Um, and then how do you feel about him in terms of prospect ranking, in terms of what you, what you're expecting out of them next year, I think the really fun thing that the Cubs can do in their system, and I don't think it's like, I don't think it's um, sort of hacky or gimmicky. Like, I think it makes a lot of sense to have the Hernandez brothers play together in Myrtle Beach. I think it will help Alexis, who's a rising prospect in the system, like assimilate to that life more. I think Christian can take something from going back to where he's comfortable. And so I think it makes a lot of sense to have him go back to Myrtle beach. Um, and you know, at this point it's sort of like his future is what he makes it a little bit. Like he's obviously going to have to jump another level to, to be like on a real radar for like major league consideration down the line. But the one thing I will say about Christian that I don't think we talk about a ton because his expectations for the bat were really high and he hasn't met them is like, he's done the big stuff, not great, but he's done the little stuff really well. You know I mean? You look at the year he had both defensively moving over positions when Jefferson Rojas got there. And then on the base pass, like he really succeeded in those areas. And I think showed some really good baseball instincts that will help. The question is just, you know, it's, it's sort of very simple. Does, can he get the bat to the ball at a better rate? And, you know, if he can, then I think he will rise up prospect list again and, and maybe get to the points where he was when he started in the system. And if he can't, then like, we know how that goes too. Yeah. I, but the question, the question was just, what's your outlook? I don't know, man. I, he's, I, I have him ranked lower than I, I did this time last year, obviously, you know, um, am I more worried than I was? going in like this time last year of course um do have i given up on him absolutely not he's still a teenager <laughs> um i i don't know dude i i, I think that it's gonna be tricky I'm, I'm excited to see what he does next year hopefully like i'm with you hopefully in myrtle beach i think that him and alexis playing side by side i'm with you i think that could be something um outside of of great for the Myrtle Beach promotional team. I think it could be, <laughs> it could be just good for both of those guys. I think it could drive both of them to the next level. 
um, yep. for two different reasons. Reasons like you laid out. I think it motivates Christian. It's like I'm supposed to be at a higher level brother. than Alexis. Yeah. yeah, and I think it motivates Alexis to be like, oh, like I'm I'm here, man. Like let's let's keep it rolling. I need to show out with my brother. So, um, yeah, man, I'm I'm excited for that for sure. Um, I actually I'll I'll kind of wrap a, a question of mine into this because I, I had it listed out here. Um, I've been going through on Northside Bound on Twitter. Uh, you can find us just at Northside Bound, um, or sorry, at Inside Bound on Twitter. And I've been kind of laying out different similar types of prospects with each other um, and seeing like, how they rank, how people rank them against each other. And four guys that I had were Alexis Hernandez, Christian Hernandez, <laughs> Christopher Passiola, and Pedro Ramirez, uh, all guys that are um, either in spent time in Arizona or Myrtle Beach last year. Um, all four teenagers, all four uh, infielders, maybe second base, shortstop, third base. Uh, I don't know, dude. How, how do you how do you rank those four guys? Because I I struggle. Like these these lists that I'm kind of putting over on the Northside Bound Twitter account, I'm struggling. There's a reason why I'm putting them out there. I'm kind of gauging people's people's other people's opinions of it. But those four guys, what do you got? Yeah, it's funny. The I on a notebook paper in front of me, I have what I wrote out as the top forty prospects in the system, and um, you know, I probably won't share this list for a while because it will change by the time I w- would actually publish it. But um, literally, I have um, 18, to, 18 through 20, Josh Rivera, Christian Hernandez, Pedro Ramirez. So two of the guys you mentioned, like, didn't did not rank. I just wrote like 18 through 20, yeah, figure it out yeah. later. Um, and so those, those are like sort of clearly to me, Christian Hernandez and Pedro Ramirez are those four guys, the two better prospects. Um, but yeah, separating them out. I mean, those are just the most different players. Like it's crazy for two guys who sort of have come up at the same timeline, um, who, who sort of come from, from the same place, um, just how different they are, you know, Pedro, got strong so fast in life. Like, you know, you don't often see um, guys built like that. Um, Christian still just sort of dripping with projection. Um, Pedro, like, just gets the bat to the ball and, like, hits liners. Christian misses a bunch, but when he hits it, like, shows that that down the line it's going to be really fun. So um, I would have those two one and two, but I don't know which order. And then I think I would probably have Alexis third and, and Passiola fourth, um, just mostly based on what the results were in the complex league this year. But, you know, if if anyone in the organization told me like Passiola's checking a ton of boxes behind the scenes, I would very easily flip them. I don't feel real strongly about it. Yeah, I uh, I love to see you know like the the uh, I, it's probably on fan graphs or whatever where it has the different uh, like stand the MLB standings so like the NL Central standings and it shows from like game one to like game one sixty two and like mm-hmm. how the teams like interact with each other like oh like the Cubs are in first and now they're dropping down and the Brewers are catching up and stuff like that I love to see that with these four guys in their like pro careers or like they're like they're like how we view them I don't know how we would go about doing that but it's like. <laughs> Like at first it was like Alexis or so it was, it was Christian Hernandez way above, way at the top. And then Pedro kind of had a little blip up uh, during his time in Myrtle last year. And then he came back down and they came back up. It's, it's, I think it'd be really interesting to see that. I, I don't know. Dude. I, I think all four of these guys for me are hovering in like the, the probably 25 ish range, give or take five spots i don't know it's we were talking before we started recording it's like for me as i'm putting together my list like 19 through 34 are just a big old jumble like i yeah i don't know how i'm ranking any, any of these guys i would i would say that that christian alexis Passiola, and pedro ramirez are all around 25 ish in the system for me i think i can share this that without giving a specific name that um i know there is one um prospect site um, prospect um, group, a group of people that rank prospects that are going to have a very high Pedro Ramirez ranking very soon. And so that's exciting. And, you know, I, it, I think it's, it's sort of foolish for us to ignore other people that have really strong opinions about, about the prospects that we have. Like if somebody's like, that's a dude um, like go, it's going to make me go back and watch the tape and think like, okay, Am I missing something that they're seeing? And so, 
Uh, I know people are going to see that probably in the next three weeks here. So be on the lookout for a very, very positive Pedro Ramirez ranking. Yeah, that's important, right? I mean, like being able to, I mean, we, we watch these guys a lot <laughs> um, and an unhealthy, unhealthy amount, really. And honestly, besides like the prospects that Cubs prospects are playing against for other teams, I'm not going and watching like a just a, a random uh, like Memphis Redbirds versus Nashville Sounds game. You know, like I'm not I'm not going and watching that like w- without a Cubs prospect being in it. And so, like to have some like some like national publications and stuff like that that follow all of the league. That's super important to yep. to to listen to what they're saying because they're they're getting a, a different type of context than what we're getting on a daily basis. So. Um, all right, man, we got, let's go, let's go one more listener question here, um, from P PCA Stan, same, um, where is the most redundancy in the system? Who is most likely to be traded this off season? Uh, I kind of lump those questions together. I think it's important. Uh, we kind of hit on this a little bit when we were talking Triantos earlier. Um, I, it's a, this is a unique conversation that can be talked about here on a Cubs prospect podcast. And it's probably also being talked about uh, with Corey and Brendan on CHGO or the, all the other guys over at CHGO because it's it's applies to the major league team as well and how they're going to get better because it's really important at the major league level. I mean, I, I know for for those guys up there, the the they've talked a lot about the skeleton is already there for the Cubs major league team, right? And they need to bring in some high end talent, whether it's something crazy like a, a Juan Soto, Pete Alonso, something like that. Uh, regardless of the situation, is the Cubs need to bring in some like high end major league talent, not not like the Ian Happ level of player, but like someone who's a middle of the order bat or the top of the arm rotation uh, member. And so um, that's where these higher names and prospect uh, rankings get thrown around, right? That's where the the Alcantara's and Trianto, Trianto's is even probably the, the next tier down, obviously. So it's the the Owen Casey's, the Kevin Alcantara's, the 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 Matt Shaw's stuff like that that gets thrown around. Uh, what I guess do you view as the most redundancy in the in the organization first? Yeah, I mean, without like trying to be glib about it, like I guess I don't necessarily believe in the idea of prospect redundancy. You know, like Cubs have too many shortstop prospects. Cubs have too many catching prospects. Like we've heard that over the years. You know. <laughs> If you guys have been following this for 20 years, like Dave Kelton, Eric Kinski, Ryan Grip, too many third basemen, and then, you know, Kevin Ori comes up and sinks and they don't have any third basemen. Um, so, it, you know, that stuff happens all the time. It's good to have a ton of players at a position to have more bites at the apple. The one thing I will say is when you talk about a 40 man roster, um, there's only 40 spots and using them efficiently is really important in baseball. And I think the idea of having four guys on a 40 man roster that are all right-handed hitting corner outfielders that are not ready to come up to the major leagues is just inefficient use of the 40 man roster. And so, you know, we're talking about Brennan Davis you know, Alexander Canario made it up to the majors, so he applies a little less. But like, this is why Nelson Velasquez was traded because he was in this group of guys. Kevin Alcantara is in that group. Um, you know, it's just a really crowded space. Not in terms of like, are there going to be enough spots at Wrigley for these to fit these amazing talents? Like that stuff is going to work itself out in the long run. But when it comes to building a competitive playoff team for 2024 and 2025, you need to use your 40 man roster efficiently. And I don't know that you can use it super efficiently if you have that many guys of that player type sort of at the back end of the 40. Yeah, I, I honestly could not have said, said it better myself. I think you nailed that. Um, I'll, I'll take the opposite end of the spectrum and talk about guy like, Talk about the the guys that likely will not be dealt. I right now, as I look at this organization, look at this system, yeah. um, there's really not a whole lot of guys that really jump out at you as surefire starting pitchers. Um, I, Kate Horton's up there, Jackson yeah. Ferris is up there, Ben Brown is up there. Um, I, I mean Jordan Wicks is is up in Chicago by now. He's technically still a prospect, but whatever. Um, I just don't see them dealing from Ben Brown, Jackson Ferris, or Kate Horton. I, I, I that that's not that's not a scenario I see happening, especially when 
I, I believe in the Cubs pitching development. And I think that there are other guys that are deeper in prospect rankings, deeper in the organization in terms of level that they're, that they're at or um, in their prospect status that I believe in. And I believe the Cubs can make into decent starting pitchers in Chicago one day. But I just think that they're, I would be, even if they're going after a Juan Soto, a Pete Alonso, dealing from Cade Horton or Jackson Ferris would blow me away. I would be shocked if the Cubs deal Cade Horton or Jackson Ferris. Yeah, I mean, Cade Horton's probably gotten, frankly, he's probably gotten too good to trade. You know, I, baseball has really gotten away from trading top 20 prospects very often anymore. Um, Jackson and Jackson is in a bucket with, for me, with like Jefferson Rojas, where it's like, like those are really exciting talents that I think other teams would really value in a trade, but they're probably going to value them more in a year when they're top 50 prospects or, you know, wherever these guys are headed to. Um, so it would be kind of a bummer for, for me to have those guys specifically traded because it's just like, you know, wait a year. And, and if you want to trade them then, um, because they can fetch you a real star, you know, great. I think that's an awesome problem to have, but trading them just sort of at the beginning of the ascent would, would be a mistake to me. Yeah. You're just selling the stock too soon (laughs) at that point to to phrase it like that, you know, I mean, um, yeah. And I, Dude, I, I don't know if you've got this question a whole lot. I've got this question a lot is who are the untouchable prospects in trades? Um, and I'll lump this question in with all these other questions and we'll wrap up with this. And it's like, I, I can't emphasize enough how like I don't, uh, I, I truly, I'm not even playing stupid. I, I don't understand like what untouchable means. Like, I, I don't get yeah. it. I, I tweeted this out recently. I was like, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand what it means. And I got people responding and I, I think that like people understand where I'm coming from, but it's like no prospect is untouchable in a trade. PCA and Kate Horton are not untouchable. You can put together a package that could likely convince me of major league talent that, that I could trade Kate Horton and, and, and uh, uh, PCA. Yeah. Now is, would the package have to blow me away? Like, absolutely. Like it would have to be an incredible, like Juan Soto plus type package or like whatever, you know, but I would try like, the, the goal is to make the major league team better. <laughs> yeah. If, if Cade Horton trading Cade Horton for a bunch of studs at the major league level is what it takes, then heck yeah, I do that. You know? So um, I don't like, I, I just don't think untouchable is a thing in my vocabulary when it comes to trades and prospects and all that good stuff. Is that, yeah. Is that and it, <laughs> no. And I mean, it's just, you know, those guys are in a guy like Pete Crow Armstrong is in just a really weird place in sort of asset valuation where like, it sounds weird to say it, but like Pete Crow Armstrong is a more valuable asset than Juan Soto. You know, he is a more valuable asset than Pete Alonso. Like um, if, if it was one, like the average fan is going to want that deal all the time, right? They're going to say, Oh, trade, trade him. But you know what the Cubs look at there is not only is it like six years of the player, but then you also have the odds that the player extends beyond that. So like, you're looking at a window of like six to 13 years w- with a player. Um, but also like you take it from the other team's angle and like, there's a real chance that you get nothing there that like, yeah. there is a chance that Pete doesn't work, that he doesn't hit enough in the majors. So like, could I really trade a superstar with like three, three years left on his deal for a guy like Pete or Armstrong that's, that's unproven. No, I probably wouldn't want to do that. So like, the middle ground of finding a major league player that is um, a similar asset value, but also like in the same sort of like tradable realm for the other team is just really hard. And, and it is why like very truly major league baseball stopped trading top 10, top 20 prospects in the last five, seven years. Like they, they just stopped doing it because I think they got a couple teams got bit a couple times trading top five guys and, um, you know, it, they just decided it wasn't worth it. Like Dansby Swanson's a good example, you know, of a guy that got traded really quick. That was a number one overall pick that like, you know, it just didn't make sense for the Diamondbacks in the end to have done that deal. And, um, you know, they, those deals don't really happen anymore. So like whether Cade has sort of reached that point or not, I'm not quite sure, but he's pretty close. Yeah, I mean he's he's arguably the best right-handed or the best pitching prospect in all of baseball. It's, it's Paul sure. Skeens, Kate Horton, and 
that is fun in, in my opinion. So, all right, man, we've, we've rambled on enough about all kinds of random topics. Uh, you want to go ahead and plug yourself before we wrap this up? Yeah. Um, you guys can find me over at Twitter X, whatever we're calling it these days at, at cub prospects. Um, also, you know, we hang out sometimes on this discord that, that Greg Z started. And if you guys want in on that, then, then shoot us a message and we'll, and we'll get you a link over to the discord. It's been a fun time hanging in there. Yeah. That's always a lot of fun. I just, I just post up on the prospects thread on that. Obviously I don't dig into the other ones as much, but it's terrific. I love it. So, uh, you can find me on Twitter at out of the vines. Um, yeah, check out the, the discord for sure. You can find this podcast, um, on, um, Instagram. I've been posting, I posted those graphics from the award show on Instagram. That was, that took everything out of me, man. That's, that's all my, <laughs> all my, all my social media game in terms of promotion of the podcast out of me. That took everything out of me. So, uh, find us on, on Instagram, uh, Cubs on deck, um, find the show anywhere where you listen to podcasts over on the YouTube page. I'm going to try getting into that. I know I probably said that last, last episode too, but I'm going to try getting into the YouTube a little bit more. Uh, I think this week, you guys, if you guys are listening to this on Tuesday, I think uh, tonight there will be a uh, live stream on the YouTube page. Me and Brendan Miller of CHGO nice. will be taking over, answering prospect questions, but also major league questions, all that good stuff. So uh, check that out, please. Come back to the YouTube page over at Northside Bound and, and pay attention to that. Besides that, uh, we'll be back in uh, likely two weeks. Uh, just look on Tuesday mornings regardless. Uh, and we'll be there uh, back with another episode of this, this Cubs on Deck show. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll talk to you guys soon. Go Cubs.